Dirk uh, uh, is a graduate, uh, graduated director at the Italian National Academy of Dramatic Arts, and uh, he is going to make a short presentation. Please join me to extend a very warm welcome to Dirk. Good evening, everybody. So I try to keep it short because I promise to keep it like in 10 minutes. It's the first time that I do something like that. So I hope that he will not be bored because this is what I do. I try to make things and not bore people, but tell stories. So many of my friends who work for humanitarian relief agencies recognize the important role that culture plays as a, as a crucial element of the recovery process immediately after the end of an armed conflict or war. They think that culture should not be considered a luxury to take care of later. Many others think that attention to culture is not a priority in a post-conflict situation in the same way that health, food, and housing are. They are convinced that culture must wait. So why is culture, and specifically culturally, uh, cultural heritage, not a priority for so many people? Why is it being reduced to a secondary role so often and confronted only after the so-called primary needs have been met? One reason may be that cultural heritage, rather than being viewed as a positive force, is often considered an obstacle to rebuilding and a disaster situation to start afresh with tabula rasa, you know, is very tempting. New facilities and administrative systems apparently are better suited to the new situation. Traditions and heritage are viewed negatively as outdated and an obstacle. <laughs> You know, in these three days, I heard many interesting and deeply researched lectures by illustrious scholars and bright thinkers, but I'm neither a historian, nor an anthropologist, nor a scientist or an academic. I'm a filmmaker, sometimes a director, sometimes a writer, sometimes a producer. I'm a storyteller. So I want to tell you a story. I hope to keep it brief. A story that started eight weeks ago, when together with a colleague, I was riding a crammed Toyota minibus along an endless curved wall behind an airfield where we had landed earlier. We made a short, uh, sharp right turn and we have to brake before a checkpoint. We hear some rapid Arabic from outside and then a bright, smiling, overweight soldier opens a van's door and shouts at us, welcome to Baghdad. <laughs> we are let go and drive onto the highway towards the Tigris River and right into the city. For the coming week, we will be members of the international jury for the new Baghdad International Film Festival, one of the very, very few cultural initiatives in the country. Two ex-professors of the Iraqi Academy of Fine Arts founded the festival. The inaugural edition in September 2005 took place during a time when sectarian violence had reached horrifying levels. The festival director recalls how on our opening day, the city saw some 20 or so car bombs. All of Baghdad was under occupation and there were tanks in the streets, but the audiences never stopped coming for a change. That was 2007 uh, and five, sorry. Since then, a lot of things have, uh, have happened in Baghdad. This year's festival is supposed to be the first real international edition with 300 films from 60 countries. And it is perceived as Iraq's first step back into the limelight of international cultural life. Imagine our surprise when we learned that the festival was 100% financed by Western institutions and that this year it got almost canceled. Perhaps you will remember, only three weeks before the festival opening, there was the infamous Mohammed video that had started spreading through the internet like a virus, provoking uproar in a considerable part of the Arab world. So deep was the fear for retaliation and violence that the embassies and cultural institutes in Baghdad were extremely worried to appear as the festival's official sponsors. Just minutes before the deadline for going into print, somebody had a saving, a life-saving and pragmatic idea. All the official logos and greetings from embassies, cultural institutes and so on were stripped from catalog, flags, leaflets and so on, while everybody kept the assets and their promises in place. Security reasons also played a role in the choice of the festival's venue. It should have taken place in a prominent place, ideally a cinema, but in Baghdad, a city of seven point million people, there is no cinema. Before 1991, Iraq had 270 cinemas, but the international embargo following the Persian Gulf War prohibited filmmaking equipment and celluloid from entering the country, so no new Iraqi films were made. Students at the Academy of Fine Art continued studying film, but movies would be made on video. 
After 2003, the last war, what remained of the dwindling in uh, industry was almost completely destroyed. An especially dark day came on August 1st, 2007, when the Semiramis Cinema, a theater that was a Baghdad landmark, with three levels of red velvet seating for 1,800 viewers, had to close. Today, apart from two small private screens, there is not a single public cinema in Baghdad and in the entire country. The comparison of the golden past with the present underscores other unfortunate themes in Iraqi society. Birhan Shawi, an Iraqi writer, worries that while the political idols, idols have fallen with Saddam, the cultural idols remain like ghosts, threatening our souls and our brains, I'm quoting, and leaving their shadow on our creativity and our thinking. He bemoans that Iraqi television stations are largely tied to or financed by political parties of foreign uh, countries. He describes channel surfing these stations as providing a historical exhibition of Iraqi mummies. Even though Iraq today disposes of considerable budgets, film and culture in general depend on private initiative. Institutions are busy with the economy, national, international trade, rebuilding houses, and so on. While it is true that security is still a huge issue in the country, it seems that the government is ignoring that especially the film industry, alongside being an expression of culture, could also become potentially a huge economic factor. What is even, what is even more worrisome is that education seems not to be on the government's agenda. Briefly, Iraqi culture to me seems sort of a paradox. On the one hand, it claims the achievements of an ancient and great civilization, while on the other hand, modern Iraqi history is marked by violence, war, and discord. Interestingly, the distinguished Iraqi historian and sociologist Ali Alwardi argues that Bedouin culture formed the bedrock of Iraqi society. Characterizing Bedouin culture, he writes, are three elements, tribalism, raiding, chivalry. Each of these elements is defined by the concept of predominance. The Bedouin individual seems to persuade by the force of his tribe, his personal strength and his sense of superiority. Because of the lack of rules to adjudicate conflict, Bedouins use force to avenge transgressions. This, the writer argues, explains why there is near permanent war in, Be in Bedouin societies. War in the desert is the reality, peace is a fleeting phenomenon. Post-war Iraq, and we see it, in, uh, and we saw it in Baghdad during the festival, is hungry for culture and the media frenzy created by the international festival can reach a wide audience and maybe even attract the attention of politicians who until now seem to be totally uninterested. Many of the films shown at the festival are already two or three years old and therefore not really fresh, but the sheer number, 300 films from 60 countries, is quite impressive and apparently the concept works, or so it seems, because at the opening ceremony a lot of politicians from multiple ministries have appeared. In the following days, many young filmmakers talk to us. Their interest in dialogue and cultural exchange is high and helps us to bridge the very scanty knowledge of English and, to be righteous, our non-existing Arabic. One of the most negatively impressive things they describe is the hopeless situation of the Academy of Fine Arts, which is considered to be Iraq's national film school. Classes are limited to dusty film theory of the 70s. There is no practical training whatsoever. No equipment such as cameras, monitors, or editing suites. And anyway, Iraq has no national film fund. Nevertheless, the students are brimming with ideas, and each of them has half a dozen projects in, in, in his pocket. But after decades of dictatorship and four devastating wars, they have no clue about the cinema history or the cultural history of their own country and consequentially are totally unable to build on anything. It is as if, uh, if they were cut off their own culture, as, as if they lost the relation with their own tradition. Since the birth of Iraqi cinema in 1948, about 100 films and many more documentaries were produced. Most of them were destroyed or disappeared in the confusion of the three Gulf Wars. One of the few remaining films is the first purely Iraqi film, Fitna Wa Hassan, from 1950, directed by Haidar Omar. The film is a variation of Romeo and Juliet and, interestingly, was produced by a Muslim, a Christian, and a Jew together. At the time, not very uncommon. Today, unthinkable. Not too long ago, a group of young German Iraqi, uh, young, sorry, uh, Iraqi German and Iraqi French filmmakers contacted the French Cinémathèque Nationale for help. 
founded in 1901 with the mission to preserve the world's, the world's uh, cinema heritage, the Cinematheque offered to take care of the restoration of all the surviving films of Iraqi production, a costly and long process. The French put just one condition, which was really a formality. Iraq should join the Cinematheque's association as a member. The annual fee for that was approximately 800 euros. Well, the official response from Iraq was, they didn't know how to justify this cost. The French were flabbergasted. I was too when I heard this story. Which brings me back to the initial question. Why does culture always come last? Or as the former Minister of Culture of Spain, Ángeles González Sinde, put on the first day of this conference, why is culture still considered an embellishment, an ornament, and not essential for the survival in case of crisis? True, our current situation in the EU is the unfortunate proof, at least in countries like Spain, Portugal, and most of all Italy, that even in Europe, cultural budgets are the first to be cut down or simply cut, period. True, the impact of war on a people's cultural heritage is a difficult topic to broach. In times of death and destruction, people come first. With the end of active combat and the start of recovery, the immediate human needs of shelter, food, and health have priority. So does proper respect for the memory of the dead. None of this can or should be denied. A concern for cultural heritage at such a time runs the risk of appearing to be indifferent to these priorities. Yes. But the anthropologist Valin Smith has written some very interesting lines about these. Wars are without equal as the time, uh, something like the time markers of society. Lives are so irrevocably changed that culture and behavior are marked by three phases. Life before the war, during the war, and after the war. It is sobering, I think, to reflect how often these or similar phrases must be used around the world today. Culture itself is transformed by conflict. A lot has been said in this conference about the usage and application of cultural diplomacy, and I tend to agree with almost everything. Unfortunately, it is my personal experience that in the reality of everyday life, many still do not understand what that actually means. Cultural diplomacy, in my opinion, and in my experience, must help to make politicians understand, before even applying it, that rebuilding society cannot be done only by economic reconstruction, but that culture should be recognized as an important factor of rebuilding early on in the recovery phase, following a period of war armed conflict. Culture cannot wait. In many post-war situations, there is evidence of a popular concern to immediately restore war-damaged heritage and to revive tradition that before the war had been out of date. This concern seems to answer to a strong psychosocial need to establish familiar and cherished things following a phase of violent disruption. It can be distilled in the concept of thread of continuity that people search for when the rhythm of everyday life has been shattered. In such situations, the crucial role of culture must be recognized and incorporated early on in the recovery process. I bring it back to Baghdad. Festival goers and us jury members were very positively surprised when the announcement was made that on the occasion of the appointment of Baghdad Cultural Capital of the Arab World 2013, the Iraqi Minister of Culture had awarded the equivalent of $10 million to selected film projects. So, selected film project, what does that mean? Some of those films would have cost a million dollars, an outrageous amount for uh, Iraq today. When the enthusiastic applause subsided, a young man asked, were the selection criteria made by who? And how were the films selected? No answer. Another one proposed to donate 5% of that budget for the restoration of the Academy of Arts. No answer. So what initially felt like a, positive, uh, like a positive thing of the Iraqi government began to feel odd, more like a quick shot than a sustainable funding measure. Festival director Tahir Alwan, however, defended the ministry, saying that he believed that they made a good investment anyway, even though not many young filmmakers, he said, will benefit from this initiative, and we are still far away from regular state support, we are finally back into producing films for the first time in 10 years. I understand his position, because as a festival director and cultural agent, he's like the air between the hammer and the anvil. But some reasons for that, some reasons for trying to find a position between, between things 
can perhaps be found in the long years of Saddam Hussein's rule. Political isolation, isolation, and the dictator's regulations narrowed the ability of Iraqi writers, journalists, and artists to exchange with colleagues from other countries. Those who had a chance to attend meetings outside Iraq did not return. This led to a bifurcation of culture, which ultimately created something like a double Iraqi culture, a culture of exile and a culture of domestic uh, descendants. I'm not sure who of you remembers this. Two years ago, for the first time ever in film history, there was an Iraqi contender to the Academy Awards. The film was called Son of Babylon, and it was directed by Mohammed al daraji who grew up in Sadr city, which is one of the worst neighborhoods that you can find in Baghdad, considered to be one of the most dangerous ones. One morning during production, al daraji got a phone call. Overnight, he had lost his very, very little Iraqi financing for the film. Nobody told him why, but Daraji was sure the reason for his decision was that the day before, he had chosen a Kurdish actress over an Iraqi one. It took the film five years and 17 co-producers, 17 co-producers, before he could start shooting in 2009. But at the end, Son of Babylon was 100% financed by European and North American institutions. It shows the dependence of Iraqi film and consequentially Iraqi culture on foreign investment. But at the same time, it was also and is until today the most striking evidence that an Iraqi independent cinema does exist. And it was a boost to the international perception of Iraq. Two minutes and I'm finished. Yes, some of the films that we saw at the festival by the next generation of filmmakers were awkward in their mise-en-scene. The characters are sometimes too stereotypical. Some scenes feel too wrong and reflect, especially when they deal with violence. But it is their work that let us see how the young generation begins to reflect on their profound changes in the country by decades of war and conflict. It is their work that, that confronts for the first time the past and the present. And it is their work that lets us catch the first glimpses of a new cultural identity in the country, an identity that struggles to cope with the past as much as with the present, and that will take quite some time to rebuild itself. On the last day of the festival, we drive through the boulevards. The blast walls are almost gone. For the first time, I can actually see Baghdad, very different from how I experienced the city some years before. It resembles like many, many other cities in the Middle East. The only difference is that now there are many more ruins here, half-destroyed houses along the, along the roads, and bullet holes stare, away, stare back from almost every surface. A veil of gray-brownish dust covers everything, a silent reminder of war and chaos. At dinner, I have the feeling to taste that dust even in the Tigris river fish that we are served. After dinner, Somehow we miss the convoys that were supposed to take us back to the hotel. So we do something very strange. We begin to walk across the Tigris boulevards and walk along it without accompaniment, without escort, passing checkpoints of baffled soldiers gazing after us. In any other place in the world, this small nocturnal walk would be a normal thing to do, but not here. Here, for all of us, especially for the Iraqi members of the group, this night becomes an experience of long-lost normality. Since the early 90s, CNN and others have burned the image of war and chaos in Iraq into our collective visual memory. Iraq that meant roads with corpses and burned out wrecks. The nights illuminated by tales of rockets and mortar shells. The day by the dark fumes of burning oil uh, fields. Still, when I get back to my hotel room, high above the city, and look down towards the nightly Firdo Square, perhaps you guys remember. For the first time, my memory does not immediately switch to the overturned but still dangling statue of Saddam Hussein. You remember that? For the first time, I see Baghdad as a city with lights and life. The struggle for survival in this country, as in Afghanistan, in Sudan, and other conflict-ridden places, today is also a struggle of cultural survival. But what I've seen here in the last days the young people especially, have given me the hope that the efforts are as intensive as the violence and passive resistance directed against it. 
I hope that the Iraqis' pride and their cultural heritage will prevail over this interest. I hope that politicians here and in other countries will recognize the importance of culture for reconstruction and actively, actively use it to rebuild the people's damaged identities. And I wish that the young Iraqi filmmakers would reestablish that thread of continuity between the past, the present, and the future. Only then, I'm convinced, they will not remain onlookers of their own history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Van den Berg. It was a very penetrating analysis, and you brought to our attention and to the attention of the audience a problem. Yes, we know it, but it was very useful. So we know much uh, more about what is going on in Iraq in that particular field. We are great, very grateful to you. Actually, uh, Ambassador uh, Cynthia Schneider was going to ask a question, but do we have time uh, so that she can? OK. Thank you so much. But I didn't mean it to be only me. I mean, maybe other people have questions, too. I think it's so interesting. Uh, well, thank you. but I would be happy to give priority to other young, I suspect some of the young people are really interested too, and I thank you so much for that. I had the pleasure at Georgetown of hosting Waleed Shamil, did you meet him? Uh, and Haitham, I'm forgetting his last name, anyway, some, George, some Iraqi uh, theater directors and their students in last June. I have a project with Haitham next oh. year. Well, we have to so. talk about that, because, uh, and they told us these hair-raising stories about people theater actors coming out after bombings in the city and yeah. performing spontaneous performances to kind of reclaim that space. I mean, yeah. talk about the integration of culture and violence. It was extraordinary. But I'm also friends with Oday Rashid, who's one of the, he probably wasn't there, he's one of um, perhaps their leading filmmaker today who left and now is living in New York um, and he left after his best friend, a very well-known television uh, uh, announcer, was murdered in his kitchen at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, unquestionably, by the government. Um, and so I'm wondering, I mean, <laughs> I'm not surprised that the government is selecting the filmmakers. I'm not surprised that they're not supporting anything. How much do the filmmakers, and by the way, thank you, American government, for this government, but... but um, how much do the filmmakers feel they can actually make their films and say what they want to say? How much of a problem is the political censorship? I think it's a huge problem. I mean, it's, it's not even censorship, because in order to censor something, you have to have something that you can censor. The problem is that they, that they start even before that. They select the people who can do things, you know? That, that is really a huge problem, and it is not very transparent, and it is not transparent at all who selects what and who can produce things. And this is not the same, not, not only in Iraq you have that problem, you have the same problem in, in, in Afghanistan, you had, even before the war started last year in March, you had the same problem in Syria, and even in other countries who, that, 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 that seem to be more democratic from that point of view. So very complex, very, very complex answer to that, to that simple question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is the other program ready? One, one more question? Okay. In between the questions, I, I, am, I have an administrative announcement. Uh, somebody who had his lunch in the black and white restaurant forgot his iPad there. I, iPod, is it? iPad. iPad. So, it is there, it's available there. And now the second question. So I understand you covered everything. We are very grateful to Dirk van den Berg for his explanation and for having brought to our knowledge how the situation in Iraq is. Thank you very much, please join us.